I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. Oh, I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this. Intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Lori and Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on Mental Health News Radio. It's our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. (laughs) So just so our listeners have a template on um, on who the two of you are, Lori, if you don't mind going first, just give a little bit of your background. Sure, I'm happy to. I am the executive director of the Behind the Scenes Foundation, which is a 501c3 charity which assists entertainment technology professionals who are seriously ill or injured. And we have other programs which we'll obviously get into a little bit later. I uh, was also the executive director of the Entertainment Services and Technology Association for almost 30 years, which was an industry trade is an industry trade association uh, for companies uh, that supply entertainment technology products and services to the industry. And while I was there, uh, oversaw the formation of the ANSI Accredited Technical Standards Program and the Entertainment Technician Certification Program, among other initiatives. I have worked in the industry as a lighting designer and stage manager for dance and symphony, theater, musicals, etc. I've worked uh, for a theater consultant, a uh, theatrical lighting supply company, and a manufacturer of entertainment products. So been around for in the industry for ooh, about 40 years, a little over 40 years. You know it well. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, how about you? Sure. Um, I have been a clinical social worker for about 20 plus years. Um, First started out with chronic and severe and persistent mental illness clients back um, in hospitals, mental health agencies. I'm currently the senior director of Music Cares. Um, We are the charity of the Recording Academy. And we provide assistance to the music community. So it's anything from direct financial assistance around basic living needs to mental health support, substance misuse. Um, We also do a lot of education and panel presentations on topics that are of interest to the music community. Mm -hmm. So it, it really weds my clinical experience Um, and my love of music, though I am not a musician. I always add that. (laughs) (laughs) I always add, I'm not a therapist. I'm a, (laughs) I'm just such a grateful patient of therapeutic services. And, uh, that's why I created this network initially was to say, thank you for being my healthy parents, but I am not a clinician. (laughs) I get it. I get why you need to put that in there. (laughs) And I think it's lovely that, you know, with your background that you do what you do. I mean, that's amazing to me. I love it when we, we in mental health infiltrate other industries that aren't necessarily associated with mental health. Yes. (laughs) And I say infiltrate in the best way. (laughs) Well, talk to me about, um, and I'll, I'll direct this to you, Lori, talk to me about behind the scenes foundation. Why, why did you create it? And, um, and how long, you know, how long ago was it created? 
Well, we're amongst the newest of the entertainment industry assistance organizations. We were formed in 2005. And we created it because we saw a need for a, a charity that would assist those who work solely behind the scenes. We say behind the curtain, behind the camera, on the road, uh, and for the companies that supply entertainment technology products and services. We uh, saw so many people who really fell through the holes elsewhere, didn't qualify for one reason or another with other organizations, and we wanted to provide that safety net for them. And uh, that has formed the core of core mission. But over the last few years, we have expanded um, into recognizing the tremendous need in the industry and in the mental health area. And uh, really, you know, spent about half a year to a year, it seemed like every conversation I had came around to mental health and the fact that there weren't a tremendous number of resources directed at people in our industry and that recognize some of the unique challenges and stresses uh, of working in this industry. So we wanted to try and address that. So we put together uh, a steering committee last late last summer of uh, people with specific expertise in the subject matter. I think Jennifer was the first person I reached out to to join the committee. <laughs> Uh, and people with a real passion and a knowledge. So we have a mix of representation. We have, um, I think, five mental health professionals on the steering committee. We have representation from major employers, from unions, uh, et cetera. And it's been a, a tremendous experience in working with them. A question for both of you. Um, you know, 2005, certainly mental health was not on anyone's radar in terms of um, a popular thing to talk about. Um, I know when I started doing my podcast, everyone said, and I'm talking people who are high up in the industry, um, that our therapist said, my God, don't name your company mental health. Uh, it'll tank. And I thought, well, isn't that the point? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, not to tank, but to, you know, eradicate the stigma. So it wasn't a big deal then. Have you seen more interest in it? Obviously, you knew those challenges were there in 2005, but has the public's acceptance of talking about mental health been a somewhat of a driver in you making more public the association with those kinds of services, or was mental health part of this from the get-go? It certainly wasn't part of the behind-the-scenes remit from the get-go. I think that the a combination of the expanded conversation in general, just amongst the general population, and a growing awareness of people in our industry uh, has really brought to the forefront. And, and seeing rising rates of, of suicide, of uh, addiction, et cetera, has really brought it to the forefront. And Jennifer can probably speak more so to that even. You know, mental health has always been um, this unspoken <laughs> topic. Yeah whether it's in the music industry or out. And I, I agree with you. Um, people like to come up with all types of, um, whether it's wellness, mental wellness, emotional well-being, <laughs> it's mental health. And I, I always think let's call a spade a spade. And if we want to further destigmatize this topic, let's let's name it what it is and talk about it and use words that people can relate to. You know, in the music industry, mental health, like Lori mentioned, we have seen numbers of uh, people ending their lives by suicide. And each time we hear of one, the topic of mental health, um, it gets going. And I would say in the past few years, it has been, extremely well talked about and there's been quite a momentum to acknowledge and have an industry shift to recognize the importance of mental health maintaining mental health out on the road um, and talking about it um, and there needs to be a culture shift because it has to yeah. trickle down from the top yes um, absolutely and and i think that you know Lori can can talk about how we've been um, addressing kind of trickling down from the top or trickling down rather um, because 
people at certain levels can buy into it, but we need everybody at the top to say, yes, you know, the manager important. needs to say, yeah. this is important and let's figure out how we can make sure our artists are healthy and well and asking them how they are. Right. Uh, the days of, oh, don't ask because we don't want to open a can of worms are over, my friends. <laughs> well, unfortunately, they're not. That's the well, I know. I'm saying yeah. it, it yeah. should be over, but um, it should be. that's my yeah. statement to it. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It's, it's, it's ridiculous when you look at how much of an impact it has on every other sector of healthcare. So people, I know personally from where I grew up and who my friends were and the industry, you know, the the um, entertainment industry that their families were in, you know, the amount of hours alone that people, um, which they always said below the line, but uh, I know that you're saying I'm behind the scenes um, and I don't know enough to know, differentiate between the two, but that's the term that they would always use. And the number of hours that people were expected to work. And I would always think to myself, uh, because I was heavy involved in mental health at the age of 12 doing advocacy. So I, I would think, you know, people that don't get enough sleep mm-hmm. and they're overworked will have mental health issues no matter what. Yeah. I mean, that's probably yeah. the single biggest issue. We did a, we started our work by doing a survey of the industry last year. By the way, below the line is technically, is a term that's generally used in relationship to the film industry. Okay, okay, um, gotcha, gotcha. But, um, uh, we did a survey of the industry and we had a remarkable response to it. And we received a tremendous number of comments of, of we threw in an open ended question at the end and just said, is there anything else you want to tell us? And what we learned to no one's surprise, but across the industry, whether you're working in live events or you're working in, you know, performing arts or film and uh, television production, whether you're on the road with a tour, Probably the single biggest issue for people is the number of hours they are working, which leave no time for sleep, no time for self-care, whether it's physical self-care, mental self-care, no time for family life, you know, uh, work-life balance. Um, It is the single largest issue uh, affecting people. And, you know, when you add on top of those long hours, you add the, the stress that comes with you know, if you're in live events, the curtain goes up at eight o'clock every night. And, you know, if you're on a, on a uh, tour, you load in a certain time and you've got to load out at a certain time and get to the next city. So there's just tremendous levels of constant stress as well. Yeah, that's, that was something that, you know, really surprised me, but I'm, I'm not surprised at the response you got. I love that. I was thinking, oh, I, I bet there were some encyclopedic answers to that last <laughs> <laughs> But it's so great that today, and, and I've seen it over the last few years, I mean, I started my podcast uh, eight years ago, and this is when people were like, podcasting, that's going to go nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see, right, okay, you do this little mental health show, whatever, and then to see everything change. I got very excited um, when I saw, oh, all right, big companies are now putting their initiatives behind mental health, not because maybe they really care, but because they see, oh, it's good for business. What that told me was, well, if it's good for business, then that means that money, I saw the positive in that, that money is going to get put behind these kinds of initiatives. And that is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we know that mental health affects one's ability to perform. And so that yes. directly affects what happens in the workplace. So it's to um, an employer's benefit <laughs> to make sure that they are paying mind to an employee's mental health Absolutely. and wellness. Why do you think, I'll throw this to, to both of you, but we'll start with you, Jennifer. Why do you think that there was um, such a hesitancy to even speak you know, speak about any kind of emotional issue, emotional trauma. Um, Do you think it was because of the term mental that made people scared and the connotation that that came from? Or do you think it was, you know, to do with other things? I think there's just always been such a stigma related to mental health. And certainly we know in 
um, various communities, cultures, it's taboo to mm -hmm. talk about one's problems, one's limitations. I think people see it as weaknesses. Right. And certainly what I know as a therapist and what I know as a, <laughs> as a patient and in treating people all of these years, it, it's much more of a strength to be able to acknowledge one's concerns and uh, I would say limits as opposed to weaknesses, right? Because you can only grow from that. And I think when it comes to when I, I'll say the entertainment industry, Lori speaks more to film and TV, but in, you know, in the music industry, if, if someone is taking time off to take care of themselves, somebody else gets put in that spot. Right. And so one, you know, I've heard people say, I, I can't go to rehab because I somebody's going to find you. out and I'm not going to be asked to mm -hmm. be their sound person again, or I'm not going to uh -huh. be asked to be their session player again. So there's fear of, of loss of work. There's fear of reputation. Um, and, you know, that all then speaks to one's success in the industry. Um, so, and that directly then relates to one's financial status. Right. So true. in terms of the industry, there's, there's so many reasons why um, mental health is one affected and impacted. And then it circles back to why people might um, not mind their mental health as much. And what Lori would tell you and what I would tell you is we want to get to the point where someone can say, I need to go to a therapist the same way that someone says, I have to go see my podiatrist, my, yeah. my podiatrist, my <laughs> endocrinologist, what have you. Right. Yeah. I mean, what Jennifer mentioned is true across all aspects of the industry. Um, there is that culture of just, you know, you've got to just tough it out. Um, these people are used to solving everyone else's problems. Right. They're used to being in the shadows and, and fixing everything for everyone else. So for people to sort of open up and say that they might need help is very difficult for them. And they are also very much afraid about losing position. You've got to remember that most of the people working in this industry are essentially gig workers. They don't have steady jobs. It's they go from job to job and it's all about their reputation. It's all about how good a worker they are and how easy they are to work with. And if they're afraid, if they ask for time off, they're simply not going to get the next job. There are lots of people standing in line behind them who want that next job. Right. And so it's just a culture that really works against, you know, us trying to do this, which is why it's going to take such a major cultural change. What and I think, I'm sorry, and I think just to, to add to that, if one doesn't have health insurance, mm -hmm. there's another obstacle mm -hmm. to Absolutely. seeking assistance, to seeking help. Or you have health insurance, but it doesn't include mental health benefits. Exactly. And, and that is the biggest barrier in terms of having the resources to seek support. I think, I think it's fascinating that here I do what I do and have this entire network, and, but I'm also self-employed. I run you know, my own company, and my health insurance that I'm able to afford to have does not include mental health care. Yeah. We, and we find even with the, the policies that most of the people around the industry use may have, if they do have mental health care, it's extremely limited. Right. And frequently the few mental health care professionals that are on, on it aren't accepting new patients because they're so booked up. Absolutely. So it, it becomes a real issue. Um, one of the other things that came out of our survey uh, was uh, so many people mentioned the difficulty of seeing a therapist who didn't understand anything about what they did for a living. And so uh, the recommendations, the suggestions that they make, made to these people were just completely unrealistic given the, you know, the nature of their working lives. Um, 
so our the committee's response was to create a uh, an entertainment industry therapist finder fantastic we were able to work with a, an organization called health pro to customize a finder and only therapists who have either previously had clients in the industry so they've been educated by those clients about what life is like in the industry or who have had professional professional experience in the industry themselves are listed on the finder so it means when an industry person goes there and searches they automatically know they're going to get someone who gets it who understands mm -hmm. what they do for a living and understands those stresses and challenges yeah i can't i can't imagine uh trying to explain mm -hmm. how this to someone who doesn't know not everyone has jennifer's background <laughs> yeah, right exactly and and it seems very glamorous when you hear oh i'm out on tour you know i'm 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 the rigor going out on tour it it sounds glamorous to some people and oh, little yeah. do they know it like you or like we mentioned there's lack of sleep there's a lack of connection there's loneliness there's inconsistency a lack of permanency it's not glamorous and and the therapist needs to understand that culture and not buy into what everybody thinks the entertainment world is right exactly exactly you have developed incredible programs we are actually working with one of them since we uh, we have this mental health network for podcasting and, and now we're moving into other areas of digital media too but we also have our first responder mental health network and many many podcasters are current or former first responders and so we heard about i relate because we were looking for an app that uh, would you know help people who uh, wanted to, you know, we're all on our phones anyway. So except for me, I cannot have carpal tunnel, like you wouldn't believe from 25 years on computers and a phone, but um, yeah, everybody else can use it just fine. So this is how I heard about what you guys do. And I, I think it's incredible. You've got other programs too, but what do you think, I'll throw this to you, Lori, um, the driver was, I mean, it's obvious to me, but for listeners to seek out, you know, what people are paying attention to today, they're not paying attention to reading long books, but they are paying attention to what they can access on their phone. So it was very astute of you to, to link up with a company like I Relate to do, to offer this. You know, we began looking at I Relate long before the pandemic hit and we realized it could be an excellent tool um, for all the reasons that Jennifer just said. The people in this industry tend to be, first of all, they keep hours that are not necessarily conducive to being able to speak with uh, family, friends, or even therapists. Right. And they do deal with a tremendous amount of, um, of loneliness if they're on the road, or even if they're working um, in theater or on a film, they're away from families and friends for long, long hours. You know, we wanted a, an app where someone could come home from a, a show or a shoot or, a, you know, if they're on a tour, come back to their hotel room and it's one in the morning and they can't sleep because they're troubled. They've got something on their mind. Right. We wanted to give them a safe space where they could reach out to others within the industry who, once again, understood what it was like to work in the industry, understood what they were going through and could offer some peer support. Mm -hmm. um, to say, you know, I've been there and, and this is how I dealt with it, or even just to listen. Um, and so we, we looked at, I really, we knew that first responders were using it very successfully and, uh, it just made sense to everyone. I think we pushed up the, the launch of it, if you will, a bit because the pandemic then hit and we knew that people would be particularly isolated and it, it could become even more important but the idea was just to make it available to anyone, no matter where they are, no matter what time it is, no matter what's on their mind and give them a same safe space. I think one of the big things about I Relate, as you know, is that as a peer-to-peer -peer chat app, it can be completely uh, anonymous. Right. You set your own username. So, you know, people often can have a hard time talking to friends or family uh, about what's really troubling them. So to be able to open up anonymously yet to people in the same uh, profession, the same industry, we thought could be very helpful, uh, particularly in this time. And there are some people who just, you know, they have their own stigma around 
you know, getting mental health services or they can't afford it. So that's what I love about it too. Um, you know, mental health is mental health. I'd love it if everybody would go to therapy. To me, it's like the greatest gift you could give yourself, but I totally understand, uh, you know, that if, if that's something that you just absolutely find abhorrent, you need to have a place still to get it out of yourself. Mm -hmm. and be validated by somebody else that completely understands what you're going through. Absolutely. And, and we sort of looked at it that way. It's, you know, for those who can't afford therapy, for those who aren't quite ready to make that commitment yet, it gives them still a way to, to be able to talk about what they're feeling in a safe space. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the organization as a whole in terms of, I want to understand and I want my listeners to understand how this works. How do people know about you? And if they hear about you, what's their way of connecting to get, you know, their access to some of your resources? Well, the, uh, the resources are reached very easily. Um, if I can throw in a URL right now, sure. uh, which is BTS for behind the scenes, BTS help, H E L P dot org slash mental health. And that is an area on the website where we have links to our various resources like the peer to peer chat app, which we call be seen, be heard and the entertainment industry therapist finder and other things. And, uh, we encourage people to uh, to go there to to share that link uh, with others. All of those services are at no cost, except the the I relate peer to peer chat app, but that runs ninety nine cents a month. Right. So you know it's less than twelve dollars a year to have, to have a, a safe community to talk with. And as our committee is continuing to work on uh, lots of upcoming uh, programs, resources, tools, and as those are launched, they will uh, be posted there. You know, we share it through obviously all the people who are on our steering committee, such as um, Jennifer, but we do a lot of outreach to all of the um, industry media, whether it's publications, um, podcasts, uh, you know, you name it, e-newsletters, et cetera. Um, and uh, we just try to, to get the word out in as many different ways as we can. Um, we're very lucky to have the IATSE, which is uh, the union for a great percentage of the backstage workers, if you will, uh, in the industry, uh, is a part of this. They sit on the steering committee, and they've been wonderful about getting the word out to their members through all of their channels, and that's been extremely helpful as well. This drive you know, that you have, how welcome have organizations been? Uh, to you, and I'd say obviously there were there are challenges. You've been around since 2005, but over the last three years, mental health has been such a so much more uh, you know open and talked about and welcome. So, what have you seen in terms of this organizations you reach out to to say, hey, this is us. This is what we do. Can you work with us? What's the welcoming committee been like for you? <laughs> Uh, it's been remarkable, I think, since we launched this initiative. It really, I've been um, quite uh, amazed at how it, well it's been accepted. Um, I find that there are a lot of organizations around the world that are uh, working on, you know, similar similar things for their various populations. It's it's clearly a time when this is all coming uh, to the forefront. Um, I think that the we're seeing more and more acceptance. Um, it was an interesting thing. I think it was two years ago now. Jennifer had introduced uh, me to uh, Dr. John Draper, who's the executive director of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And I had him come out to speak at a symposium I was one of the organizers of. And afterwards, we um, did a survey and asked people to, you know, tell us what they thought about the sessions. And I thought it was so interesting that his was by far the highest rated session, but also the lowest. And the comments on the low end were, you know, I came here for technical stuff. I didn't come here for any of this mumbo jumbo, you know, touchy feely stuff kind of thing. And I suspect if we did a, uh, a session like that now, 
we would see very few of those really negative comments. I think yes. particularly with the pandemic, there's been a lot of focus on mental health and I think we're seeing more people come around. Jennifer, would you agree? I do. And I, and I think that um, I was so excited when Lori came and told me that Dr. Drake would be speaking at the symposium because the goal was for him to just go and normalize that this is all okay and that we can talk about this and Lori can, can speak to this more, but she said, you know, men in the room would get up and talk and that's unheard of. So if, if that can happen more and the behind the scenes mental health initiative is there's so much momentum. And I can tell you all of us on this steering committee are extremely committed and the, there really is passion when we discuss programs and Lori brings ideas and proposes um, new programming. And clearly it's, we know it's needed, but we're definitely seeing this, the seeds growing that have been planted over the past couple of years. Good. Oh my gosh. Thank goodness. So, and that, that's been very um, exciting for me to see. Um, I also, I, again, I, while I work with a lot of people behind the scenes, um, my understanding, and again, Lori can speak to this um, in greater detail, but I think it is mainly male centered. And so there already is a type of, I don't need this. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about this, but from what we've seen on the survey, people do want it. They do want to talk about it. And so it's just, raising awareness and opening up conversations. Um, and, and the survey spoke a lot to what the industry is yearning for. And, and that's what this initiative is really trying to meet those it's, needs. It's really just about our humanness. I, that's what I try to, I don't have, feel like I have to beat the drum as hard. And sometimes I worry that it's because I'm in this bubble so deep that I, that's all I see. But I, it really is different. I mean, when I first got into being so public about, about mental health, you know, I would go get a haircut or go to a restaurant and I would, you know, drop the bomb. I'd sometimes I'd look at a friend and say, get ready because here I come with the bomb. And the bomb was, I'm going to bring up a mental health topic and watch the table turn into crickets. Kristen just ruined dinner again, you know, that kind of thing. And that doesn't happen anymore. For me, it doesn't happen. I can be at a non-mental health event or dinner or at the hair salon, of course, not lately because of COVID, but <laughs> and say something about anxiety or depression or suicide and everybody will ch chime in. People actually come over to have the conversation. So that is so exciting to me. I wonder, are you two seeing that as well? I, yes, um, definitely, but there is still very much um, a, an existing culture uh, within the industry where it, it's still not something to be talked about. And someone who has, you know, mental health problems is, you know, a problem on, on your crew or, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, there is still a, a pretty fair amount of that, unfortunately, which is why you know, the, the committee has been having a lot of call, uh, calls lately where we talk about how are we going to um, educate leadership? How are we gonna, gonna work with them to get them to understand um, what creating a, a safe space at work, you know, looks like and feels like? How are we gonna get attitudes changed? Um, and, it will take time. It doesn't happen overnight because there is very much this, this culture in the industry of we're the strong ones. We take care of everyone else's problems. We don't have problems of our own. We fix problems kind of thing. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a matter of, of slowly changing, you know, years and years of a type of work culture. Yeah, cultural yeah. conditioning over the years. Absolutely. I, I see what you're saying. I asked one of the producers that I work with um, on the film side, you know, he really wanted to do a podcast and uh, talk about some of the issues that he has that would fall under the mental health 
categorization. And, um, and he said, you know, I'm really nervous about it because it's fine here, Kristen, to talk about it. But if, you know, my other job where I do a lot of below the line work, um, it, you know, if they find out that I, I don't know, I'm really worried about being hired. And this was a month ago. And I, I went, wow, I need to, I need to get out of my bubble more because it, it shocked me. Yeah, no, it's still, mm -hmm. it's still very much the case. And so, you know, our, our job is to try to, to change those attitudes. Yeah. Mm. And I think this, this can be an interesting time. Um, you know, COVID, it, it's an unprecedented time and everybody, for the most part, whether they want to admit it or not, is experiencing some anxiety. Oh, yeah. Um, and to say the least. Um, and so it, it will be curious to see if when we are through all of this, um, if there will be more of, um, if people will be more open to admitting Right. Um, their how they were feeling during this time um, right i know it because I know. it's because it's it's a globalized feeling absolutely uh, everybody that's what's so interesting about this because i i hate the word normal but it, it that's the best word for this mental health has been normalized because everybody on this planet has had struggles with what's going on with COVID and those struggles are related to other things, but very definitely their mental well-being. Well, and as one of our committee members pointed out on a call yesterday, you know, our industry was one of the very first to stop working and it will be yeah. among the very last to go back to work. Um, and, you know, because of, of people being reluctant to gather in large numbers and, and that type of thing. So, even as people are perhaps just about to stop, start back to work in some states, for example, they've approved permits for, for shooting, you know, so film and TV is going to come back sooner than certainly than live performance. Right. Um, but the world that they come back to will be totally different. Yeah. How their jobs are handled, how life is in their work culture. They're going to come back to a completely different world than they left more so than most industries. And this is gonna cause increased anxiety as well. Um, you know, they're, they're all hoping they're gonna get back and everything's gonna just sort of pick up where they left off and it's not. Mm -hmm. So we're cons really concerned about people's reactions when they come back to work and they see the tremendous number of changes in their environment and how they're gonna react to those. And how work is, is changing. There are so many things that are being developed using technology to be able to deliver entertainment. And it, you know, a lot of it is using things like Zoom or, you know, in any kind of software like that. And, and that's changed so much um, how things are done. And that's not going to go away. This wasn't just a blip. You know, it only happened during COVID. I, I'm seeing that where a lot of things have, have switched to online platforms or it's going to at least be 50-50. Yeah. And, yes. and, you know, for all the people involved in live events, whether it's concert tours, dance, theater, music, you know, it's all about that live experience. Oh, yeah. It's all about people together in a room sharing a communal experience. And that you know, that's going to be the last to come back and it will have changed when it does come back. Um, so it's, it's a big culture shock for everyone. Absolutely. And we, we still don't know what it's going to look like. So right. exactly. We're still figuring that out. Mm. Well, we know how people can connect and that's fantastic. Um, one thing I want to throw out, I know I brought this up with you, Lori, during our initial phone call, but I want to say it publicly too, that if you guys decide to do a podcast, it's on us to um, host it for you, to uh, help you market it, all of those things. Uh, just if, if I was trying to figure out a way, how can we be a part of of helping as well. So that offer is, is obviously still there if and when you decide you want to do that. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. People right now, as we've talked about, are, are experiencing new feelings, new 
thoughts, you know, because of everything that's going on. And we uh, have a link on our website to online behavioral self-assessments. And basically, these are just tools for people to sort of check up on their uh, emotional wellness, on their mental health. Um, if they're feeling things and they want to sort of get a sense, is this normal? You know, should I be feeling this? They can take one of nine different self-assessments. These are done online. They are completely anonymous, completely private. Uh, they answer a series of questions. They can choose to take sort of a broad range uh, series of questions or they might want to focus in. Of, I, I really think I'm showing signs of anxiety or depression or maybe they're coping with substance misuse or alcohol misuse or an eating disorder. And they answer a, a simple series of questions. And at the end of it, it's going to essentially say you're actually doing you know really well or it might say yeah you you know you are showing signs that you're suffering from anxiety here's some information about anxiety you know let's demystify it here's what it is you know right. millions of people experience this and here are some of the signs of it and then it will point you to resources and one of the things our committee realized that if you get online and you start to you know research mental health resources, you become overwhelmed very quickly. There's it so causes much greater problem. anxiety. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Right. There's tremendous anxiety. So we've created a series of uh, resource pages on our website that just try to make navigating that simpler. So, you know, we've got the 24-7, 365 hotlines. We have information on suicide uh, prevention, on mood disorders, anxiety, depression, bipolar, on substance misuse, etc. And then uh, under each of those topics are sort of nationwide organizations that provide tools and resources and assistance. And we've in fact put icons on that sort of indicates if the site does have particularly good educational information or if it offers some real skills building, maybe some online classes people can take. And we've created a, a set of pages for the US and, one, and a set for Canada uh, as well, and just to, to make it easier for people to find help quickly, especially at a time when they might be overwhelmed. And you can take those self-assessments on behalf of someone. Maybe you're worried about a friend or a spouse or a child, a partner, whatever it might be. You can actually go in and answer the questions sort of on behalf of that person. And, and that will give you some information if you're wondering how to approach the person and to say, you know, I think you're suffering from depression and you need some help. It gives you information and tools to take in and use to help that person. Mm, fantastic. Can you share, Lori, where listeners can find out more about you and also your organization? I know you gave one website already. If you don't mind, give that again. And then I know you have another website as well. Well, actually, it's it's all one website, um, just uh, two different ways of reaching it. But it's uh, btshelp.org is the main website. And if you add slash mental health, it will take you straight to the mental health pages. But of course, there's a link off the main website to the mental health pages. Fantastic. And Jennifer, for people to find out more about you and about Music Cares, where would they go? Um, they can go to musiccares.org. That's M-U-S-I-C-A-R-E-S. -E and they can also go to grammy.com, which would lead them to Music Cares. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for coming on and doing the show today. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you, thank for, you for all you're doing. We really appreciate it. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Mental Health News Radio. Hi, listeners. I'll make it quick. These are some really cool places that give discounts and other cool things for listeners of Mental Health News Radio Network. If you want to get amazing help with healing from narcissistic abuse, go to healfromanarcissist.com. If you want CBD products that are the best of the best, I use them myself, go to pros, P R O Z E.com and use the code mental health 20, mental health 20. If you want to get daily perk ups that help retrain your brain to think more positively, go to perkupdaily.com. And also, 
just because this one's fun. Snarkycandles.com. I guarantee you'll love them. Snarky with a Y, S-N-A-R-K-Y, candles.com. And don't forget, if you want to hear all the shows on the network about first responders, you can go to firstrespondermentalhealthnetwork.com and all of our shows that focus on narcissistic abuse, narcissisticabusehealingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening and back to the show. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial.